A lot of us probably don't fully appreciate the impact that our muscles have on our daily lives. Try to imagine what your life would be like without muscle tissue. The first thing that pops into your head is probably that you would have difficulty moving, sitting, standing, walking, and so forth. Um, but also consider, blood wouldn't circulate because the heart couldn't propel it through your vessels. Lungs couldn't empty their fill. Food couldn't move through your digestive tract. Virtually all of our physiological processes and dynamic interactions with the environment in some way involve muscle tissue. Recall from our earlier introduction to tissues that muscle is one of the four primary tissue types, along with connective tissue, epithelial tissue, and nervous tissue. Muscle tissue is composed of specialized cells called fibers that respond to electrical stimulation from the nervous system by undergoing internal changes that cause them to shorten. This shortening then exerts physical forces on other tissues and organs to produce movement. There are three histological types of muscle in the body. Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And although the process of contraction is somewhat similar in all three, they vary in terms of their location, appearance, and their means of nervous system control. So just take a look at these three pictures for a second and think about what similarities do you see in these and what differences do you see between these three different types. Skeletal muscles are going to be cylindrical, long cells. In fact, most skeletal muscle cells go the entire length of the muscle. They're multinucleated, and those tend to be um, located around the perimeter. They're striated, and these striations reflect the overlapping patterns of parallel, thin, and thick contractile filaments. And it's also voluntary. You have control over whether a skeletal muscle contracts or does not contract. Cardiac muscle is obviously found in the heart, and these muscle cells are short and often branching. They contain only one or two nuclei that are more centrally located. They are still striated, similar to skeletal muscle, but these muscle fibers are involuntary. I can't tell you to stop your heart beating. You have no control over that. And then smooth muscle. Smooth muscle probably has the most distinct shape of all the muscles. It has this kind of fusiform shape to it. Um, there's only one central nucleus in the smooth muscle, no striations, and they are involuntary. We're going to discuss cardiac muscle and smooth muscle in a little more detail in module four, but not in, we're not going to go too deep into those, but we are going to be focusing a lot on skeletal muscle in these first two modules. Now, all muscle tissue is composed of muscle cells, as in a, and as I mentioned, those are referred to as muscle fibers. The two terms are synonymous. And there are several common properties to all of these muscle cells. One is excitability. Excitability is the ability of a cell to respond to some type of a stimulus. So skeletal muscles respond to stimulation by the nervous system, and this occurs by neurotransmitters being released from the neurons, and some smooth muscle also responds to circulating hormones. There's contractibility. Contractibility is the ability for these contractile proteins to slide past each other, and that causes a muscle to shorten, like you can see here in this figure on the right. This is going to then exert a pull or a tension on whatever structure the muscle is attached to. Elasticity. After a muscle is either stretched or shortened during a contraction, it has the ability to return to its original strength, just as if you took a piece of elastic and stretched it out and let go, you would see it snap back to its original form. And then extensibility. Extensibility is the lengthening of a muscle cell that occurs when the muscle is stretched and isn't contracting. Skeletal muscle specifically has multiple functions, and the most obvious of which is probably some type of movement. Bones of the skeleton move when muscles contract and pull on the tendons that attach those muscles to bone. Skeletal muscle also works to maintain posture and body position. Without constant muscular contraction, we couldn't sit upright without collapsing or stand without falling over. Skeletal muscle also protects soft tissues of the body. For example, the abdominopelvic cavity is lined with layers of skeletal muscle that help to support the internal organs and to protect them from injury. Skeletal muscle helps to maintain your body temperature. Muscle contractions require energy, and some of that energy is then converted to heat. That heat can be released by contracting muscles and help to maintain the body's normal internal temperature. And skeletal muscle also regulates the entry and exit of material. Circular skeletal muscles surround the openings of the digestive tract and the urinary tract, such as this external urethral sphincter muscle. And this helps to provide voluntary control over swallowing, defecation, and urination. 
Now, before going any further, I do want to take a moment to point out that muscle tissue is only one component of a muscle. A muscle is an organ, and recall that organs contain multiple types of tissue. Skeletal muscles not only contain muscle fibers, but also blood vessels, nerves, and connective tissue sheaths that surround the muscle fibers and connect the muscle to the bone. An individual muscle cell, as I mentioned, or fiber is quite long. It runs the entire length of the muscle, but it takes groupings of many muscle fibers to actually form the width of a muscle. I like to think about skeletal muscles as being organized as bundles within bundles within bundles within bundles. A cross section of an entire skeletal muscle clearly shows how it consists of multiple bundles called fascicles, outlined here in green. In between the different fascicles, you can see that there are also blood vessels and nerves in that muscle. Now, a single fascicle contains multiple muscle fibers, outlined here in blue. And recall that a muscle fiber is equivalent to a muscle cell. Muscle fibers then contain bundles of myofibrils, and myofibrils are made up of contractile proteins called myofilaments. Now, while a single myofibril can run the entire length of the muscle, it takes many successive groupings of myofilaments to run the entire length of a myofibril. There are three concentric layers of connective tissue that encircle each individual muscle fiber, each fascicle, and the entire muscle itself. We just recently introduced connective tissue, so now let's do a quick little review. Hopefully these look familiar to you now from our discussion on connective tissue proper. Test yourself a little here to see if you can recall what these three types of tissue are and how would you describe them. Pay special attention to how the collagen fibers are organized as I've identified here with these yellow arrows. So in this figure on the left, the collagen fibers all run parallel to each other. While notice in the middle photo, bundles of collagen fibers are oriented in random directions. And in the image on the right, the collagen fibers exist independent from each other and they're interwoven with elastic fibers as well. So these three types of connective tissue, dense regular connective tissue, dense irregular connective tissue, and areolar connective tissue will all be incorporated into the structure of muscles and several other structures that we're going to be talking about in other systems in this module and for the rest of the course. Obviously these are pretty long names and so frequently in this course you're going to see me abbreviating these different tissue types to um, accommodate the space on the screen. So I'm going to reference dense regular connective tissue with a DRCT if you see DICT, that's referencing dense irregular connective tissue, and ARCT is going to be areolar connective tissue. But I'm also going to continue using small little icons of these images. So hopefully that'll kind of drill that into your head and get you thinking about what those look like when you see those terms. So this is the same figure we were just looking at, but I've also added an isolated fascicle and an isolated muscle fiber to help emphasize the connective tissue wrappings on the structures, which I also still have the arrows on. So the endomecium surrounds each skeletal muscle fiber and it binds it to its neighboring cells. The endomecium consists of a delicate network of areolar connective tissue and it helps to electrically insulate each individual muscle fiber. The connective tissue of the paramecium divides the muscle into individual components called fascicles and the parametrium surrounds all fascicles. The paramecium also encloses numerous blood vessels and nerves that supply an individual fascicle. The paramecium consists of dense irregular connective tissue. And then finally, the epimecium. The epimecium is a layer of dense irregular connective tissue also, and this one surrounds the entire skeletal muscle, and it separates the muscle from the surrounding tissues. So the epimecium is essentially bundling all of the fascicles together. The deep fascia, which you can see outlined here in green, is a layer of connective tissue that lies just external to the epimecium and is an additional sheet of dense irregular connective tissue that helps to separate individual muscles and also bind together muscles that have similar functions. The superficial fascia is posed, composed of areolar and adipose connective tissue, and it separates all of the muscles from the skin that is above them. So let's now move from the microscopic view to the anatomy of the muscle as a whole. The central bulging part of the muscle is referred to as its belly. And at the ends of the muscles, the connective tissue layers are going to merge, as you can see there in white, to form a fibrous tendon, which attaches the muscle to the bone, to the skin, or to another muscle. For skeletal muscles that extend between bones and cross at least one mobile joint, 
one of the bones is going to move while the other usually remains fixed when that muscle contracts. The less mobile attachment is called the origin and the more mobile attachment is called the insertion. So in this example, the biceps brachii muscles proximal attachment or origin is at the scapula and the distal attachment, the insertion, is on the radius. So as the biceps brachii contracts, the radius is going to be pulled towards the scapula and that's gonna cause the arm to flex at the elbow. We can also classify muscles based on how their actions relate to each other. So the agonist is a muscle that contracts to produce a particular movement, such as extending the forearm. So for example, the triceps brachii of the posterior arm is an agonist that causes forearm extension. Now, as the name suggests, an antagonist is a muscle whose actions oppose those of the agonist. In this case, the antagonist is going to be the biceps brachii. If we consider instead forearm flexion, we're looking at the exact opposite. The, the biceps brachii is going to be an agonist and the triceps brachii is going to be an antagonist. And then finally, a synergist is a muscle that assists the agonist in performing its action. So for example, both the biceps brachii and the brachialis muscles work to synergistically flex the forearm. I'd also like to draw your attention to figure 10.14, which is going to be a very helpful figure. One of the study tips that I often try to give students in this class is don't memorize what you don't have to. So for example, don't memorize the name of a muscle just based on those individual words. Think about what those words mean and that's going to tell you a lot about the muscle. And so if you kind of learn the vocabulary of muscle names, then that's gonna tell you a lot about that muscle that otherwise, that basically you don't have to memorize. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit about here. This is kind of showing you some different ways in which muscles can be named. So for example, if a muscle has the name adductor, has the word adductor in its name, that means it um, adducts the body part. So the adductor magnus happens to be a muscle that adducts the hip. Some muscles are named based on their body regions, such as femoris. We're gonna see a couple muscles with that name in them here shortly. Um, the quadratus femoris. We can also see some muscles that are named by their attachments. So for example, the intercostal muscles are between the ribs. Inter meaning in between, costal literally means ribs. Sometimes muscles are named by the orientation of their fibers. If their fibers are straight, that's rectus. If a muscle has the name oblique in it, that means the fibers are at an angle. And orbicularis, that means the fibers are in a circular formation. Muscle size and shape. So we just saw an example um, a second ago about the uh, quadratus femoris. The, we said the femoris part of it meant that it's on the femur. The quadratus part means that it's rectangular in size. And then some muscles are named based on how many heads they have and um, how many proximal tendons, how many origins. So the biceps muscle, the biceps femoris has one point of insertion, but two heads. And so there's a biceps femoris long head and a biceps femoris short head the triceps that has three heads to it and a single insertion.